I wanted to make this video today to talk about the five critical components of any forest carbon project. <laughs> so before we start, I want to first remind you that there are three different types of forest carbon projects. There's avoided deforestation, where you're preventing carbon from being uh, released into the atmosphere. There's reforestation, where you're planting new trees that will grow and take carbon out of the atmosphere. And then there's improved forest management, or IFM. Uh, where you're basically taking a, a middle-aged forest like the one behind me and letting it grow. And by doing that, you're taking carbon out of the atmosphere and you're also preventing carbon from going into the atmosphere if it were harvested. So the first of the five major pillars of a forest carbon project is called additionality. Uh, and what additionality is asking is, is the project justified? Uh, would these trees have been protected otherwise? Would these trees have been planted otherwise? Additionality for an avoided deforestation project is basically asking whether or not these trees would have been cut down if the project didn't exist. So projects that are highly additional are taking place in areas that are at high risk of deforestation, and projects that are not so additional may be taking place in the middle of untouched Amazon with no road access. For improved forest management, it's the same kind of thing. We want to know whether or not these trees were really at risk or whether they would have just kept growing. So for example, if this is a project that's owned by a conservation organization, <coughs> Nature Conservancy, uh, we want to know whether or not that organization really would have cut those trees down as they're claiming, and whether or not they're receiving credits for actually protecting trees that were at risk. And then finally, for reforestation, we want to know if those trees would have been planted anyway. A lot of reforestation projects that I've seen are sponsored by timber companies who basically just go around planting trees all the time. And they're basically just planting these trees so that they can come back after the project is done or during the project uh, and harvest the timber. Often projects will have to demonstrate financial additionality in order to exist. Uh, and what this basically means is they have to demonstrate using words on paper that they would have been required to harvest these trees in order to, to stay afloat. Unfortunately, everybody manages to uh, pass this hurdle. So the Nature Conservancy, for example, with a $1.3 billion revenue, often claims that they would have had to cut all the trees on their land in order to make money off the timber in order to keep going, which is patently absurd. When addressing additionality, really we have to take a look at it from an algorithmic approach. We have to look at the history of the project, we have to look at the surroundings, uh, and we have to take some common sense to ask whether or not this project really is protecting trees and removing carbon from the atmosphere. The second pillar of a forest carbon project is called the baseline. Uh, and the baseline is basically an alternate scenario that describes what would have happened on the project if the project didn't exist. It's kind of a subcomponent of additionality. So for example, in the case of avoided deforestation, maybe the entire project's area wouldn't have been deforested. In fact, it's more likely that maybe only 20% of that area had been deforested. If that's the case, we only want to receive credits for 20% of the forest. So, if you look at the figure on my left, basically the way that this works is that they come up with this counterfactual scenario of what would have happened to the forest uh, in which carbon is usually lost over time, uh, and they're credited between the difference between what actually happened uh, and what would have happened. And so they're actually receiving the difference between these two lines. And so you're not actually receiving all the credits for all of the carbon in your forest, you're just receiving the amount of credits that you're likely actually preserving or growing back. So for avoided deforestation, baselines are usually calculated using a reference region. Uh, and what this means is they'll select a region outside the project that's supposed to be similar to the project. They'll see what happened to that region, let's say over the last 10 years, and then they'll say that that's a likely outcome for the project. So if the reference region was deforested 20%, they'll say the project would likely would have been deforested 20%. This is okay as long as your reference region is actually similar to the project. And unfortunately, I've seen a lot of reference regions that are just plain nonsense. I've seen reference regions that are a thousand kilometers away from the project, reference regions that have completely different population dynamics, different protection status. So reference regions are a way that people can easily manipulate the system. For improved forest management projects, baselines are developed using basically counterfactual growth modeling scenarios. And so what they'll do is they'll actually simulate how the forest would grow and where they would have harvested it if they were going to harvest it for timber. In principle, this works. Unfortunately, people often simulate overly aggressive harvest scenarios. So for example, in a lot of the United States, clear cutting is not the best forestry practice. It's very uncommon in places like Tennessee and Vermont 
because it basically just doesn't allow trees to grow back after. However, you'll see these projects taking place in these areas claiming that they would have clear-cut the land, even though it's not a likely scenario for the region. Finally, for reforestation, a lot of people just ignore the baseline as a concept. They just assume that, well, nothing would have taken place here if these trees weren't planted. But in reality, a lot of the reforestation and projects that I've worked with are taking place in parts of the world where the macroeconomic trends favor reforesting the land. So for example, land has gotten cheap and timber companies are buying it up and planting eucalyptus trees. And if that's the case, uh, there's some probability that the land that you'd planted would have been bought by a timber company and planted anyway. And so ideally, reforestation projects should actually take into account the likelihood of those trees being planted anyway. Uh, and Vera is working on a protocol that will do just that. It's basically looking at the surroundings and, and basically assessing how much tree cover uh, is coming back as the forest progresses. And therefore, the, the project will actually receive a discount if it's taking place in a region that's being reforested without the incentive of carbon credits. Now, the third pillar of a forest carbon project is called leakage. And leakage is just this idea that if you protect a forest somewhere, the bad guys might just go next door and cut down those trees. So there's basically two different types of leakage. There's geographic leakage, which I just talked about, uh, and then there's market leakage. And market leakage is this idea that if I'm taking timber off the market, I'm raising the prices of timber, and therefore uh, people will just go elsewhere for their timber. Now for avoided deforestation projects, leakage is often assessed in two ways. Uh, first, it's assessed geographically by just looking at the area around the project and seeing if deforestation rates have gone up since the project began. And then secondly, market leakage is more or less assessed by just applying a, a generic discount, uh, because it's a very difficult thing to actually figure out at the global level. Leakage is a difficult concept to kind of conceptualize for small projects. Does a 500 hectare project really have an impact on the timber prices in the region or the harvest practices of the region? Probably not. The other th tricky thing about leakage is that it's kind of in direct contradiction with additionality. If, for example, we see a project that's taking place in an area that's being completely deforested and deforestation rates have gone up, often for some reason like uh, some jerk was elected president to Brazil, then that really only speaks to the need for that project to exist. Uh, so some of the best projects that I've ever seen that are taking place on the edges of the Amazon are being penalized for leakage when really it's not their fault that Brazilian deforestation has gone up in the past couple of years. So it's a tricky thing to actually get a hold of, and I think that we're probably not uh, measuring it in the most elegant way right now. The fourth pillar of forest carbon projects is called permanence. And this is basically the question of how long will these forests actually last? Usually permanence is answered by how long is the forest carbon project? The very best carbon projects are signing contracts to protect forests for 100 years. So all climate action reserve projects are 100 year long projects, for example. But increasingly, projects are getting shorter and shorter in duration as people want to protect more and more areas. It's very tricky, unfortunately, to convince people to sign contracts for hundreds of years. And so there's been a real supply shortage and, and therefore permanence has gotten less and less. We've even seen some companies trying to sell credits that only represent one year's permanence, which is essentially meaning that a landowner is signing contracts saying that they won't harvest their land for a single year. And those credits, supposedly they are preventing deforestation for that year. That's having an impact 100 years from now. And that's the case if they're genuinely preventing deforestation for that year. But the tricky thing about this is that it's tricky to say whether or not the landowner really would have harvested that year or the next. The other tricky thing about these super short duration projects is that if there's some sort of economic swing, for example, if timber prices skyrocket by 400% for some reason, then all your people could drop out of the project and they're just going to harvest their land. One of the tricky things about permanence is that it really needs to be longer than the rotation age of the trees themselves. So for example, if you're in Canada planting trees that take 40 years to grow to maturity, then you're basically just sponsoring timber business as usual. Uh, we don't want to do that. On the other hand, if you're going to Brazil, where eucalyptus trees can grow to maturity in only 20 years, then maybe your project has a, a stronger foundation. The final thing about permanence that I would like to include in here is, is there is an element of natural risk to any forest. Insects can damage a forest, flooding can damage a forest, sea level rise can damage a forest, but most commonly wildfire can damage forests. And frankly, there are a lot of uh, projects that are taking place in extremely high risk areas for wildfire. 
I would never purchase projects in many of these areas in, in Eastern Oregon or California where they're basically just timber boxes. Now, ostensibly, registries have a way of dealing with this by assessing risk and then applying some sort of deduction, some sort of discount. In reality, these are very cursory uh, assessments of risk, and the deductions are fairly small. So maybe they'll discount the credits by 5%. Now, the final pillar of a forest carbon project is called verification. And what I mean by verification is we just want to know how much carbon is actually being stored by the forest. Right now, this is generally done on the ground, uh, and this involves taking a lot of field measurements where you're wrapping tape measures around trees. There are remote sensing technologies like LIDAR that allow for verification to be done uh, using aircraft and using satellites, but generally that's not very common in the carbon world right now. Now, the one thing that I have to watch out for with verification is that some of these avoided deforestation red plus projects, they're not actually measuring their trees. They're just taking a regional average. Uh, and so I've seen some projects that are taking place in like high alpine tundra where there's barely any trees using the regional average for the state that is majority rainforest. So really, every single project should be measuring their trees either using some sort of remote sensing technology that uh, measures tree height or they should be measuring the trees on the ground. The final thing to note is that when we're measuring the trees on the ground, we do have uncertainty numbers, and those are reported and, and taken into account in projects. So you'll often see in the project, there's plus or minus 5% uncertainty, and therefore they're uh, erring on the conservative side and not issuing 5% of the credits. This is all fair, but there are some uncertainties that are not really taken into account. Allometric uncertainty is one example, uh, and this is basically the uncertainty of how much carbon a particular tree has. Uh, how much this actually adds up for an entire project consisting of millions of trees, it's kind of hard to say, but it is kind of out there and it's maybe something to think about. Finally, I want to give a shout out to a group called LEAF. They're a coalition of companies who are more or less fed up with how these carbon projects work. They've noted a lot of the issues that I've pointed out today, uh, and they're really working to design a set of protocols that uh, will be kind of resistant to that. And so they're working on revamping baselines so that there's a much more consistent and standard way of computing baselines. And then they're also working on basically solving the leakage problem by looking at leakage at a global level. Hopefully LEAF and Vera will be able to work out some new protocols that are uh, very effective. In summary, there are five different components to forest carbon projects. There's additionality. So is the project justified in existing? There's the baseline. What would have happened on the project if the project didn't exist? There's leakage. By preserving this forest, are we just taking timber from somewhere else? There's permanence. How long are we actually taking the carbon out of the atmosphere for? Is the project 100 years or is it only 40? And then there's finally verification. How much carbon is actually being removed from the atmosphere? So all five of these components are absolutely essential for carbon projects to be successful. I've seen all five of these manipulated in some way, but I've also seen a whole lot of projects that are absolutely perfect on all five counts. It just goes to show that you really have to do your due diligence before you go and buy uh, carbon credits of any kind. There are good projects and there are bad projects.